So basically what Gitcoin's trying to do is we're trying to build the ultimate capital allocation engine for these ecosystems and allow people to deploy these tokenized treasuries to allocate them to fund what matters in their communities. We're seeing a lot of adoption by L2s and LSTs and projects that want to use Gitcoin grants, the power of Gitcoin grants in their own communities. Gitcoin's flagship product over the years has been this thing called quadratic funding. And the reason why quadratic funding is powerful is also one of its vulnerabilities. As we increase the cost of forgery for attackers, we accidentally increase the cost for real users to verify their identity with Gitcoin passwords. Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst, and today I'm speaking with Kevin Owaki, who is the founder of Gitcoin, um, a grant distribution project originally on Ethereum and now on a whole lot of other chains as well. Before we talk with um, Kevin about Gitcoin 2.0, let me tell you about our sponsors this week. This episode is brought to you by Gnosis. Gnosis builds decentralized infrastructure for the Ethereum ecosystem. With a rich history dating back to 2015 and products like Safe, CowSwap, or Gnosis Chain, Gnosis combines needs-driven development with deep technical expertise. This year marks the launch of Gnosis Pay, the world's first decentralized payment network. With a Gnosis card, you can spend self-custody crypto at any visa accepting merchant around the world. If you're an individual looking to live more on chain or a business looking to white label the stack, visit GnosisPay.com. There are lots of ways you can join the Gnosis journey. Drop in the Gnosis DAO governance form, become a Gnosis validator with a single GNO token and low cost hardware, or deploy your product on the EVM compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis chain. Get started today at Gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45 plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Chorus One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Chorus One not only gets you the highest years, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at chorus.one. Kevin, you've been on Epicenter before. Welcome back. It's so glad to be back. Thanks for having me. <laughs> cool. It's been a while since you've been on, I think like two or three years. So. Um, g give us your and Gitcoin's backstory in a nutshell. Yeah, for sure. Well, um, you know, one of the cool things about uh, having been in the space for the last seven years, and I think this is my third Epicenter episode, is that um, I actually, uh, the first Epicenter episode I did was uh, within a month of the launch of Gitcoin Grants, which has been the platform that has helped the Ethereum community fund $60 million worth of open source software and uh, public goods for the Ethereum community. And um, that was uh, that was January 2019 that we launched Gitcoin 1.0. And uh, that was about the time that I that I appeared on Epicenter the first time. Um, I uh, over the last over the last couple of years, we have been progressively decentralizing Gitcoin. And I'm here today to talk about the Gitcoin 2.0 white paper, which outlines our vision for a decentralized Gitcoin. So hopefully taking the power of Gitcoin grants and that $60 million worth of Ethereum public goods that have been funded on the platform and putting in the power of any community that is based on top of the EVM. So uh, progressively decentralizing and progressively having more impact over time. Perfect. We'll talk about all of that in just a little bit. Gitcoin leadership has kind of changed somewhat over the years. So I know you were gone for at least a little bit. So what's your current involvement? Uh, so my current title is co-founder and I am uh, acting CTO of Grants Lab, which is the organization that is pushing for the software development at the Gitcoin DAO. Um, Gitcoin, as I said uh, in the intro, has been progressively decentralizing over time. 
in 2021 when the Gitcoin DAO launched. We launched the GTC token and the GT and and that was sort of like a transfer of power from at at the time Gitcoin was a corporation and I was the CEO of it. So all of the decisions sort of rolled up to me. And when it became a DAO, the decisions transferred over to the token holders who were ultimately responsible for the fate. And as part of the transfer of power, our legal team felt that it was necessary for me to disaffiliate from the project for at least a little while. And um, I think I was in total disaffiliated for 15 or 16 months. Uh, during that time, I was working on a project called Super Modular, which um, basically at the time we thought that we would kind of, the setup would be uh, similar to how the Ethereum Foundation builds the Ethereum protocol and Consensus, Joe Lubin's startup, uh, builds things on top of it, things like MetaMask or, or Gnosis. Um, that was kind of the setup between the Gitcoin DAO and Super Modular. Super Modular was building software in the Gitcoin ecosystem and Gitcoin was building the core protocols, uh, which makes me, I guess, like one one thousandth of a Joe Lubin. But uh, we were just building stuff in the in the Gitcoin ecosystem for a couple of years. And um, a, a, and after that time, I ended up reaffiliating with the project as of I think it was September of 2023. And I'm glad to be back in the fold and helping push the the core protocol forward. We're seeing a lot of adoption by L2s and LSTs and projects that want to use Gitcoin grants, the power of Gitcoin grants in their own communities. So it's quite an interesting time to be helping people fund what matters in their communities because lots of people with tokenized treasuries that are trying to build active communities around them. I have to admit that last time I tried participating in a funding round, and I've participated in many, many, many funding rounds because you've had like 20 or something, right? Um, uh, I, I must admit I gave up. I didn't make it. I did not actually make any contribution contributions at all. I think it was like in the late summer or fall last year, and I failed at authenticating enough ways to kind of get a Gitcoin passport or something, something that wasn't necessary to kind of contribute earlier. Tell us about the Gitcoin passport and why you felt it needed to be introduced. Um, and I know this wasn't just me. So basically, I know lots of other people kind of seem to have the same problem on Twitter, at least. Sure. Yeah, well, um, certainly value your honest feedback in the road to progressive decentralization has not been without setbacks. And sometimes there have been many happy to talk about any and all of them. So basically, uh, Gitcoin's flagship product over the years has been this thing called quadratic funding. And the reason why quadratic funding is powerful is also one of its vulnerabilities. And uh, quadratic funding is a mechanism invented by Glenn Weil uh, from Microsoft, Vitalik Buterin, the founder of Ethereum, and Zoe Hitzig. And basically the way it works is that, Frederike, if you have a grant that raises $100, for a, uh, $100 from 100 contributors, and I have a grant that raises $100 from one contributor, you're going to get 99% of the matching pool because we're trying to fund what matters to a broad swath of the Ethereum community. So that's really powerful because it means that lots of people will come out of the woodwork to contribute to these grants because even giving a dollar can get matched with uh, tens or hundreds of dollars from the matching pool, depending on how big the matching pool is and how many other contributors there are to the grant. Okay, so that's really powerful. We're, we're, we're pushing power to the edges of the Ethereum community by funding uh, with quadratic funding. But that power is also a drawback. Okay, so um, the the vulnerability in this, and uh, since your listeners are in the Ethereum community, I'm assuming they're adversarial thinkers. Uh, if if I have a hundred dollars uh, to my grant with uh, only one contributor, and you have a hundred dollars to your grant with a hundred contributors, and you're getting ninety nine percent of the matching pool, I have a rational incentive to make up a hundred different identities in order to contribute to my grant and get more of the matching pool. So that's what's called a Sybil attack. It's a sock puppet at attack. And um, that's why we've introduced Gitcoin Passport into the system to allow people to verify their identity and pr increase the cost of forgery in so that your identity cannot be falsified. Now, the problem that we ran into, and, and keep in mind, this is all like live beta software where we're kind of trying to figure it out as we go along, is that as we increase the cost of forgery for attackers, we accidentally increase the cost for real users to verify their identity with Gitcoin Passport. And not only do we have to, we have to walk this line where we make the system not Sybil 
si like we have to make the system civil resistant, but we have to make it privacy preserving and we have to lower the friction for end users. So um, that that's a little bit about why Passport exists and the problem that we are trying to solve. And um, the thing I'll say is that the Passport team has heard everyone's feedback loud and clear, and we they are working on a no friction way of verifying civil resistance. I can get into that if if it's interesting to your listeners, but uh, GG20, Gitcoin Grants 20 is coming up in April, and I would encourage everyone who gave up during Gitcoin 19 or Gitcoin 18 to give it another try because we've been putting a lot of work into making the friction way less for people. And I'll be curious to hear if it paid off. The nice thing about Gitcoin Grants is that we've run 20 rounds and it's it's an iteration every single round. We take the feedback from our, our community and the feedback from Vitalik and other game theorists and try to fold it into the next iteration of Gitcoin Grants. So uh, it's a deeply iterative evolutionary experiment and we value your feedback because it helps helps us make it suck less next time. <laughs> T tell us tell us what you've changed to make it less painful. Yeah, so there's two things. They're both really data science heavy, so we've been investing in some like PhD level data scientists to number one, uh there's a there's a stamp called the ETH stamp which basically goes out and uses a lot of uh complicated data analysis and machine learning to look at all the on-chain signals behind your address and to figure out if you're a civil attacker or not. So like Uh, something that that algorithm would find is that if there's 100 accounts that are all funded by the same account, that's probably a civil attacker. That's probably someone who's just gassing up a bunch of different accounts so that they can uh, that they can civil attack Gitcoin grants. So for the end user, that is a just one click connect and sign your message in order to get above the matching threshold on Gitcoin grants to get that stamp. And, uh, you know, before... Uh, I, well, you tell me what your experience was in, in, in GG19 or GG20, but before you would have to go through and click a bunch of stamps in order to get up to the threshold. And now it should just be a couple of clicks uh, using that machine learning algorithm. And then the second thing that I just want to talk uh, about really quickly is this new algorithm that it was invented by Joel Miller, who is a data scientist in, uh, on the Gitcoin team called cluster mapping. And basically what cluster mapping does is... Uh, It, it, it's, a, it's a way of clustering contributors who contribute to the same grants together and treating them as though they're the same identity. And so basically, if someone's Sybil attacking a Gitcoin grant and they make up 100 new accounts and they all those 100 accounts only contribute to the same Gitcoin grant, for the purposes of the QF algorithm, they are just one identity. Uh, and, and basically, if, if I was a Sybil attacker trying to attack Gitcoin grants, then I would have to contribute to a bunch of other grants in order to make my identities unique and uncluster them from each other. And basically what this does is it takes the energy of the attackers, the uh, funding of the attackers, and makes sure that they're funding a bunch of uh, public goods on Gitcoin in order to attack the system. So it kind of takes, like Karate Kid style, takes your opponent's momentum and uses uses it against uh, uses it against them in, in a way. So... Um, Yeah, in some cluster mapping and the ETH stamp are the two ways that we're really reducing friction using cutting edge data science behind the scenes in order to prevent Sybil and collusion attacks on QF, but also keeping the user friction low. I totally understand the approach. Is there a way to kind of escalate this if I feel misclassified? So say, for instance, I told my 50 friends that they should definitely give to, say, Rotkey. Um, And uh, they they do, but they only give to Rotkey. So basically, there's like 50 people who only give to Rotkey because I told them this is a fantastic pro project. Please give to it. Can I then kind of escalate the fact that kind of uh, they were kind of so to say disqualified from the matching pool? Yeah. So I mean, the first method of of feedback is is contacting the Gitcoin support. So in the bottom right of your browser window, you can chat with someone on the Gitcoin support team and just say, hey, I don't agree with this or hey, here's my feedback. Your UX sucks in this browser combination, Web3 login combination. That's the first layer. The second layer is that you can go to gov.gitcoin.co and you can escalate it to the DAO governance structures. Uh, so, you know, this is all transparent political economy happening out in the open. And if you're not happy with the way things that are, are working, then that's another way to escalate things. 
Um, and then, you know, the third way is just complaining on Twitter. I know that Gitcoin has had some missteps in the last year and a half, and I'm partially responsible for that as the founder. And we listen to all that feedback. And Gitcoin is, like I said, iterative and evolutionary. And your complaining helps makes, make Gitcoin Grants 21 better. So please tell us uh, through any of those channels when you, when you don't like what you're seeing. Perfect. So maybe let's back up a little bit. Why is capital allocation a difficult problem that kind of needs this level of infrastructure to tackle? I think that what we're seeing in 2024 is really quite interesting. We've got thousands of DAOs or tokenized communities that have tens or hundreds of millions, sometimes billions of dollars of capital in their treasury. And they all want to build ecosystems around their software stack. And so, you know, Justin Drake was just on a, a, a Bankless episode in which he was talking to David about how like the L2 meta, how L2s are competing with each other. And he said that L2s are going to compete uh, for liquidity and on infrastructure and on sequencers and and on tooling and on public goods. And, um, you know, like the one change I would say to to what Justin said is that is that public goods are are the way that you get all of those other things in your ecosystem. So if you can solve the problem of capital allocation, you can invite the builders into your ecosystem to build tooling, to build infrastructure, to build imp to build uh, liquidity. And um, so basically what Gitcoin's trying to do is we're trying to build the ultimate capital allocation engine for these ecosystems and allow people to deploy these tokenized treasuries to allocate them to fund what matters in their communities. So basically the problem of capital allocation is, is how do we fund what matters in, in these communities? How do we run quadratic funding rounds that, that help incentivize the outer ring of builders in your community? How do we run retroactive public goods funding rounds in, in order to incentivize uh, communities in, in order to add value value to them? So um, I, I think that like the immediate answer in the crypto space is like the most effective tactic available uh, if you're competing as an L2 or an LST or an LRT or a DeFi project is to build a community of, of hackers that are in the orbit of your ecosystem. And so, you know, that's the near term goal for Gitcoin grants is to help these communities fund what matters to them in the near future. Now, I think in 10 or 20 years, we're going to take the the tools that we have pioneered in the crypto space, we and others have pioneered in the crypto space, um, and we're going to take them mainstream. And in 10 or 20 years, I would love to live in a world in which local towns uh, and cities and states are running retroactive public goods funding rounds and quadratic funding rounds using tools that were pioneered in the crypto space. I think we can do better capital allocation using blockchains than was possible in the old world. We now can do scalable and precise capital allocation without intermediaries. We can do more democratic capital allocation than was possible before. And to me, that's the true purpose of crypto is removing intermediaries and help pe helping people get funding for doing good in their communities. So uh, yeah, near term answer, we're going to help uh, arm, arm people who are building EVM based communities. But long term, it's, it's about helping the world fund its public goods and helping the world allocate capital in a democratic way. Cool. You talked about quadratic funding earlier, where kind of the the impact your vote has depends on the square root of how much you're giving. You also mentioned retroactive public goods funding right now. Can you briefly explain what that is? Yeah, sure. So, um, but just to zoom out a little bit, um, I, one way that we describe Gitcoin 1.0 is like Gitcoin 1.0 is like a screwdriver. It only did quadratic funding. Gitcoin 2.0 is like a uh, multi-tool. It's going to do quadratic funding. It actually already does quadratic funding. It does retroactive public goods funding. It does direct grants. It does all these different flavors of, of funding. So um, t t Talk us through all of the flavors that you support now. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you asked about retroactive public goods funding. So I'll, I'll start with that. Um, Gitcoin has... Uh, I, I, I've been working with the Optimism uh, community in order to build a tool called EasyRetroPGF.xyz. And that's basically the same voting interface that Optimism uses for retroactive public goods funding in their community. Um, retroactive public goods funding, as, as your listeners may know, is based off of the idea that it's easier to fund things that have had an impact in the past than it is to speculate about which things will have impact in the future because you have all the data available about what's actually do done good in these communities. 
So basically, using retroactive public goods funding, you set up a system of badge holders who are community members who are uh, highly regarded in the community, have good judgment, and have about three to five hours per quarter in order to uh, allocate capital to to what has done good in the past. And so um, Optimism has been pioneering the retroactive public goods funding space within the Ethereum ecosystem. And we've partnered with them to make their flavor of capital allocation available to any other DAO in the uh, EVM space that wants to do retroactive public goods funding. So uh, we've got our first pilot of EasyRetroPGF.xyz available coming up in the uh, in the next month. That'll be in, in April. And uh, we're working with, I, I think I can say this on air, but uh, Filecoin, Pocket, Cello, uh, in order to earn retro PGF rounds in their community. So yeah, just just I just want your listeners to like I just want to like drill in on this point. Gitcoin 1.0 is just QF. Gitcoin 2.0 is is many different flavors of uh, of capital allocation, and QF and retro PGF are two two of the ones that we're most excited about right now. Happy to go into the others or to take questions about retro PGF. Yeah, one question about retro PGF before we kind of go into the others. Um, so you said that you have to define a set of people who are allowed to kind of make um, allocations or kind of vote on kind of what should receive funding. Why do you have to do that for for RPGF and not for uh, not for quadratic funding? Yeah, so um, we're we're kind of like almost mixing two things. Um, the the prospect of retroactive versus prospective funding is is just like sort of like a spectrum of are you funding things that were only good in the past or are you funding things that are good in the past and in the future so that's like that's like one spectrum and then another spectrum is the allow list who gets to vote and in quadratic funding there's this almost it's actually pretty radical to think anyone in the community can vote with their dollars or or their eth that they bring whereas retro retroactive public goods funding is a little bit less democratic and it's a more a little bit more technocratic so basically, you assign a badge holder, someone in your community that's well regarded and well informed, that gets to vote. And um, I, th- I kind of think of this as a spectrum of like on the on the left hand side, if it's just the core team and the founders that get to decide who allocates capital, well, that's completely technocratic and sort of like insular, and, and no one gets to decide. And uh, badge holders are just a way for for uh, communities to slowly dole out that responsibility to their most trusted community members. And and what I think we're going to see with retroactive public goods funding is communities that have had direct grants programs, and maybe there's a grants administrator who's become a power broker in their community, start to be able to dole out and progressively decentralize that that responsibility, but also that power to their community in, until you start to reach out and have what optimism has, which is hundreds of badge holders who are making decisions. And then, you know, I think the ultimate destination looks a little bit more like QF, where maybe you'll have thousands of badge holders that are making decisions about funding what matters. So it's about progressively decentralizing that power. So um, when we talk about the difference between QF and retro PGF, I think people get a, a little bit tripped up because we're actually traversing two different spectrums of the design space. The first is retroactive versus proactive. And the second is how technocratic versus democratic is, is the vote. And, um, you know, it, capital allocation is a design space. There's going to be many dots along this design space. Th- those just happen to be two that the community is exploring right now. Yeah, super interesting. Um, and what are the other capital allocation schemes that you have integrated into Gitcoin 2.0? So um, I want to be very clear about what exists right now and then what exists in the future, because I I think a lot of like one of the radical things we did with the Gitcoin 2.0 white paper is like we didn't write the Gitcoin 2.0 white paper and then say, hey, we're going to build it over the next five years. This stuff is live already. So we've we've got direct grants, which is just plain, simple vanilla grants. You can go out and a grant administrator can run an on-chain grant program. Um, We've got quadratic funding, which is what Gitcoin's historically known for. Uh, we've got retroactive public goods funding that's already live, and then we've got conviction voting pilot that we were working on with uh, One Hive. So basically, conviction voting is 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 sort of like an interesting way of doing capital allocation in which you stake governance tokens, and then you can remove money from the treasury the more governance tokens have been staked and the longer they've been staked. And then um, we've got a capital allocation mechanism called streaming quadratic funding 
which is a uh, which is a partnership between GeoWeb and Superfluid and Gitcoin, in which basically instead of funding public goods quadratically for two weeks per quarter, you could have an always on stream of revenue that is being continuously allocated to different uh, grants in your ecosystem. So those are the five that exist right now, direct grants, quadratic funding, conviction voting, retro PGF, and streaming QF. We've got a roadmap of around a dozen other mechanisms that we want to build into the Get Cooling toolbox into the future. And, um, you know, like I said, this is all in service of helping communities fund what matters. We see a future in which uh, communities are going to be funding their ecosystem in a plurality of different mechanisms. And we think these mechanisms are all complementary with each other. I, I think that the, the meta, the most effective tactic for someone launching an EVM-based community in the next cycle is going to be not just having a regular grants program, but also doing QF and retro PGF and conviction voting all, all together. And, um, and, and yeah, so the, the vision is basically to, to have an ecosystem of capital allocation that, uh, funds your community in complementary ways to, uh, just your existing direct grants program. Can you give examples of where you think each of these schemes will be particularly e effective? Because if they're, if they're all about the same, you wouldn't need so many, right? Yeah, sure. I, I'm happy to, um, The word scheme makes me feel a little bit dirty uh, because a lot of these things are deeply rooted in in game theory. But but yeah, just to, to answer your question, um, uh, quadratic funding is really good at democratic capital allocation and invites people on the outer edges of your community to fund what matters to them. Retroactive public goods funding is really good at progressively decentralizing the responsibility from a centralized grant administrator to to a group of trusted community members and then eventually many more of your community members to fund what matters to them. Conviction voting is really good at creating bottoms up momentum in your community to help people fund the the public goods that matter to them. And, uh, you know, if, if a normal governance proposal or process takes, I don't know, hours to write the grant proposal, and then it takes all of the token holders to vote on it, And in some, it spends 100 hours of, of token holder attention. Conviction voting is really nice because you, 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 you're not doing um, million dollar grants with, with hundreds, of uh, hundreds of hours of attention. You're doing uh, like a, a $500 slush fund for a party that someone in your community wants to host. And they only have to stake thousands of their, of their governance tokens in order to pull it out. So it's like a very bottoms up way of doing capital allocation. So I think these are all these things are all good at like it, it, it's simply the analogy of 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 a multi tool, I think, really works like for the same reason that uh, scissors and a Phillips head screwdriver and pliers solve different problems around the house. Each of these capital allocation tools solve different ways of doing capital allocation in your community that are all complementary to each other. So I think of it as like a multi tool or like a toolbox of different tools that complement each other. Cool. You you were just talking about staking the token that's relevant for that community. You guys also have your own token that you pre briefly alluded to earlier. What is that used for? Yep. So uh, GTC is the uh, is the Gitcoin token, and GTC stands for Gitcoin, or I like to say that it sell it stands for Govern the Community. <laughs> Um, it's a governance token, and basically uh, it's a fork of Uni, which itself is a fork of Compound. Uh, using GTC, any token holders can delegate their governance power to a member of the community that's more active uh, than them. There was, uh, the Gitcoin token dropped in 2021, and there was around 14,000 holders at that time who were delegating to about 100, 150 key decision makers in the community. And... Um, Yeah, GTC is, is basically a governance token that allows you to govern the Gitcoin smart contracts on chain. And uh, the Gitcoin smart contracts are basically the treasury. And then there's also Allo protocol, which is our capital allocation protocol that, um, you know, there's a, there's a fee switch within the protocol that is governed by the GTC holders. And then there's the, the treasuries that are governed by the GTC holders. And there's active discover, uh, discussions on gov.getcoin.co about how to evolve this uh, into the future. But um, yeah, the, the short answer to your question is just governing both Allo Protocol and the Treasury. 
Okay, then let's maybe dive into Allo protocol because kind of like the Gitcoin 2.0 vision um, is kind of like a three-tiered stack with um, the Allo protocol at the bottom or top, however way you look at it. So talk us through that. Where I'll start is that uh, we built Gitcoin 1.0 totally wrong. And I just want to like raise my hand in front of your your audience and say, I built it centralized and monolithic and I have seen the light and modular and decentralized is the way to go. So so Gitcoin 1.0 was a centralized monolith. It was uh, hosted on a AWS server in Oregon that I set up and Gitcoin 2.0 is hosted on Ethereum and on IPFS. So hooray, our public goods funding mechanisms are decentralized now. We are eating our decentralized vegetables. So um, basically, uh, this is a Allo protocol is a modular suite of smart contracts that allows people to basically, it's easily forkable. So anyone can fork Gitcoin grants and build their own capital allocation mechanism into it. But if you don't care about coding, uh, you can just basically use this tool called Gitcoin Grant Stack, which is the web application that allows anyone to run a Gitcoin grants in, in their community. So basically uh, what we're allowing everyone to do is run a QF round permissionlessly wi without any help from us. So Gitcoin 1.0 is all about fishing for you. Gitcoin 2.0 is teaching you to fish. We've now got a community of 50 to 100 round operators that are trained to run Gitcoin grants rounds in, in your community. And that's what we call the program layer. It's the social layer. People who run, understand how to run QF rounds in in various evm based communities and uh they are building they are building these programs on top of gitcoin grant stack which is the application that anyone can use to run a qf round and a retro pgf round and then that's all built on allo protocol which is which is sort of the the development layer under underneath of it so um yeah i, I think this architecture is quite elegant because it allows us to go deep on each of the capital allocation tools and build the best tool for for that design space but it allows us to go broad and build many different types of capital allocation tools into the community so that's a little bit about the architecture of gitcoin 2.0 can i add modules to that so basically if i feel like a particular distribution mechanism is definitely missing can i build that and have it integrated into that stack Yep. So um, if you don't have coding skills, you can go to uh, gitcoin.co slash grant stack, click on the GitHub, open up a new issue and make a suggestion for a capital allocation strategy. Um, if you are a software developer, what you can do is you can fork Allo and grant stack and you can augment the capital allocation strategies and then PR it back into grant stack. So um, what I think is really one of the most powerful things about open source is the ability to accept contributions from from all over the place. And and my goal for Gitcoin 2.0 is um, I want to do for capital allocation what Open Zeppelin has done for ERC20 tokens. And when, what I mean by that is this. When I was a software developer who was just entering the space and wanted to mess around with something at a hackathon for a weekend, I would just pull ERC20 Solidity contracts out of Open Zeppelin's repository. And I knew they were well documented and they were audited. And I could just take that money Lego ERC20 token and pull it into my app. And I didn't that way I could build what my app actually actually needed to do instead of reinventing the wheel of ERC20 for every app that I'm uh, that I'm building. We want to do that for capital allocation. I imagine a future in which anyone in a hackathon uh at, at an ETH global hackathon in the future can pull the power of Gitcoin grants into their app into their application for that weekend and they can instantly have a quadratic funding strategy or a retroactive public goods funding strategy that they know is documented and audited and, and and I think that what this is is we want to build the money Legos for capital allocation in uh, on the, on the EVM based stack and and what that's going to do is is propel the community forward in distributing the capital that, it, that exists in all of these different tokenized treasuries uh, across across the space and so yeah setting the shelling point for 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 capital allocation contracts and in, in making those those contracts available to any hacker in the space who wants to build QF or retro PGF or conviction voting or whatever it is into their application in the future. So that's the final North Star. Uh, we're not quite there yet. Still working on making the docs good, still uh, making the contracts really understandable. But uh, but yeah, we believe in a future in which anyone can take the power of Gitcoin grants and put it into their application. And that's enabled by this new modular architecture uh, that we presented in Gitcoin 2.0. 
you said that the fee switch for the Allo protocol is triggered by the Gitcoin token. Tell us about the fees that you may introduce. Yeah, um, I, I'd say that right now we're really just focused on providing as, as much value as possible. Allo protocol is being used in dozens of places right now. We think that there could be hundreds, thousands of DAOs that are using Allo protocol and could benefit from these capital allocation tools right now. And uh, right now we are accepting payment and feedback uh, because we just want to make sure that these tools are adopted and helping as many people as possible. There are no active plans to turn on the fee switch. I think uh, it's really up to governance whether that's going to happen or not. And I, I think keep an eye on gov.getcoin.co. But uh, you know, my constraints for actually activating the fee switch would be that it has to be done in a way that is positive sum with the communities that it serves. And I think that we're still exactly figuring out the path to financial sustainability for Gitcoin and how to how to balance the trade-offs with with uh, what that would mean for turning that on. So I guess that's a long way of saying it's up to governance. I don't know. Keep an eye on gov, gov, gov.gitcoin.co. What's the sentiment about Gitcoin token holders? Because I mean, in principle, it's like if you look at the market cap, it's kind of like probably on the order of 100 million or something. So to kind of have that kind of float, people probably believe that it'll uh, it'll be able to capture some of the value that it provides to other communities, right? I mean, I I, I think the 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 sentiment that I see expressed on gov.gitcoin.co, which is where at least in theory people are supposed to be expressing their sentiment about Gitcoin, is you guys need to get product adoption. So so basically. Gitcoin, Gitcoin DAO launched in 2021, and we're now in 2024. It took two years to rewrite the centralized monolithic stack to be decentralized and modular. And I and I think that in a in a space where attention is fickle and we're going to chase meme coins on the order of hours, not days, I think a lot of people have forgotten about Gitcoin. And you know that's fine. We we didn't execute, and uh, and you know there was a pretty hard reset between 1.0 and 2.0. So um, you know I I think that the focus right now is is on building tools that are actually useful to people and getting those adoption. And uh, you know what a, a I think like being a leader again in in capital allocation. I think like in a lot of ways, Gitcoin 1.0 pioneered quadratic funding. It, with the help of, you know, obviously we didn't write the paper, Glenn, Vitalik, and Zoe wrote the paper, but we're pioneering the actual practice of using it. And, um, you know, the game has changed. There, It's not just quadratic funding anymore. It's retroactive public goods funding. There's a bunch of different capital allocation tools in, in, and, um, and the reset from centralized and monolithic to decentralized and modular has necessitated a different approach in a, in a new era of leadership. So, um, you know, I think the honest answer to your question is that Gitcoin needs to lead again and it needs to and it needs to pioneer the space during a new era in which the game has changed. And and the sentiment that I hear that I really want to respond to is making Gitcoin a, a market leader again. And and that's that's what you'll see me pushing for at gov.gitcoin.co. That's absolutely fair. So you recently deployed to a whole bunch of chains. How did you determine where to deploy to? I mean, obviously, it's clear that uh, Ethereum mainnet was not the place to be anymore in, in, in light of the fees. But yeah, how did you decide where to you know, place your bets? Yeah, uh, well, anyone can take Allo protocol and deploy it wherever they want. So uh, that's the nice thing about being forkable and permissionless is that you don't have to rely on Kevin Owaki anymore. You know, uh, Gitcoin's going to deploy to any L2 that's legitimate and wants to fund what matters to its its community. So right now we're seeing the most traction on Optimism and Arbitrum. Allo has also deployed to uh, to Celo and to ZK Sync and to Base. And uh, wherever the communities, that wherever there's money that is going to be funding public goods and funding what matters to these communities... I, I think that we'll make sure that there is an Allo deployment to those chains. So uh, I think we're all we're all waiting to see where where L twos are going to shake out. But it's it's pretty cheap to deploy the Allo contracts to a new chain in terms of time and gas costs. So uh, we're going to go to as many L twos as there are communities that have treasuries that want to deploy them. 
Yeah, it makes total sense. You heavily rely on kind of like the future being DAO heavy for Gitcoin, right? Because kind of like allocating treasuries kind of like in a decentralized manner, this is very much a DAO mandate. How do you see the recent evolution of DAOs? Are you happy with where we are right now with DAOs? Or do you think um, we, 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 we need to push for getting to another place? I think DAOs are a fascinating design space. I, I think DAOs are, are basically crypto in multiplayer mode. What do we do when communities have to govern something together, have to push forward a movement together? And I, I was like, when said the word organization in, in decentralized autonomous organization, I think these are networks in a way. And that's just a totally different way of thinking. And it's going to take time for them to evolve. The corporate form evolved for 300, 400 years something like that from the East India Corporation to what we now know is the Delaware C Corp or, you know, I'm not sure what the equivalent is in Europe, but uh, I think it's going to take, it's going to take decades of evolution for us to figure out the final form of DAOs. And I think that, that we can't rush it. Um, I really like, I really like Moloch DAOs. I really like Compound DAOs. I, I, I think that there's a, the Gnosis Safe is just an incredibly simple but powerful tool for for helping communities work together i'm excited about new primitives like hats protocol and um you know i i think we can't force the evolution i think we have to go through the painful parts but also the beautiful parts of of dows happening and you know get, what gitcoin's trying to solve is like a very small portion of the dow stack which is capital allocation and and you're right it, it does sort of depend on on people having tokens that they want to deploy to from their tokenized treasuries to to the outer orbits of their communities. But, you know, Gitcoin's kind of a bet on the EVM eating the world and tokenization eating the world. And on top of that, I know that people are going to want to fund what matters in their communities. And and we just want to build the best stack for for doing that. But uh, maybe I could tease a little, actually a little bit. Um, I'm actually writing a book right now called How to DAO, which will be published with Penguin, uh, with Penguin Random House as a publisher in September, October of this year. So really excited to explain the design space of DAOs to hopefully a more mainstream audience coming in the fall. And uh, I think it's a really fascinating and exciting design space. I had no idea about the book, but I'm going to push on this now. So what do you think is the single thing that should be changed for DAO that would have the most impact right now? Um, it's It's a hard question to answer because... Asking about DAOs is is like asking about it's a is an extremely wide aperture. Asking about DAOs is like asking about organizations. Are we talking about a family? Are we talking about a nonprofit? Are we talking about a for profit corporation? Are you talking about an NGO? Like it, it, it's just like too wide of an aperture to even give a useful answer. So I'm sorry not to answer your question, but um, I, I think there's a bunch of little things that need to be made better. Yeah. Okay, I'll specify. Um, so in my view, the one thing that would do a lot if it were to be solved is kind of like the attention bandwidth problem, right? Kind of right now, when you actually look at the snapshots of DAOs, often um, it is votes on things that shouldn't be voted on. There's like people, basically quorums are not met uh, left and right because people kind of disengage. Do you have an idea how to 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 deal with um, the bandwidth problem for different uh, d decisions, kind of on different scales for DAOs? Yeah, I, I mean, my response to that would be, hey, what if there was a capital allocation tool that respected the voters' attention <laughs> instead of instead of assuming that they're spending tens of hours every day. On, on the governance forums. Um, so I, I think that like quadratic funding in a way sort of is that. Um, with quadratic funding, you're, you're taking a look at all of the grants in a community that are doing stuff within that community and loading up your cart once per quarter. It takes 10 or 15 minutes. It feels more like an e-commerce experience. You check out and then you're done once a quarter. And so there's not a bunch of like governance proposals to really spend a lot of time debating back and forth on and um and you know by the way i'm sorry there was so much friction in your gg19 experience i hope that gg20 is is more uh is better for you but you know my response to that is we need a capital allocation swiss army knife and we need to have more tools that respect 
the the user's attention, the voter's attention when when they're allocating capital in these DAOs. Yeah, and Kevin, I kind of I I I, I want to make clear that kind of I've I've given through Gitcoin through most of the rounds. I'm a huge fan. I think it's super. F- it it's I I just wanted kind of I was frustrated because. I think it's a really important tool, and I want to see it just work. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I I I am back at Gitcoin. I was disaffiliated for about a year and a half, and I think that Gitcoin was in the messy middle between 1.0 and 2.0. Um, but if you have complaints about GG20, please tweet at me. I'm at Awaki on Twitter, and I I read all the feedback, and we take it seriously. Uh, sometimes even if you don't see it. And, um, and and know that we we're working hard to make the user experience better. Um, we have made missteps. It is a hard design space, but G- each Gitcoin is deeply protopian. With, and by that I mean it gets better every quarter. Um, sometimes it's two steps forward and one step, uh, or one step, two steps back and one step forward. Uh, you know, especially between Gitcoin 1.0 and 2.0. But uh, we are still here. We are still grinding, and we're going to make each Gitcoin grants round better than the last one. Fantastic. So. Um, tell our audience how to get involved with Gitcoin governance if they want to do so, how to contribute, um, how to, I, I know there's an approval process for projects to kind of be whitelisted and so on. You rely heavily on volunteers for that. So if people kind of, if this resonates with people, where do they head? Yep. So uh, you can go to gitcoin.co, which is where you can find all the other good stuff. If you check out impact.gitcoin.co, that is the ticker for the amount of impact that Gitcoin has had. From the beginning uh, of, of Gitcoin's entrance in the space, I've always been very focused on let's actually show the numbers, the tangible impact that Gitcoin is, ha- ha- is having. And I wanted to stand out from all the projects that were promising the world, but not actually delivering much. And um, impact.gitcoin.co is where you can go to see our latest impact numbers as of as of uh, 2024, March 2024, we've done $60 million worth of funding to public goods in the Ethereum ecosystem. You can go to gitcoin.co slash discord if you want to join our discord and get involved. gov.gitcoin.co is the governance forum for, for Gitcoin. And um, you can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash Gitcoin. Yeah, those are the links that I would that I would expect that people could go and check out. And uh, April 2024 is when Gitcoin Grants 20 is happening. So set a reminder, remember to check out in your Gitcoin cart and uh, send me a tweet after you do it and let me know if it sucked, then tell me it sucked. If you thought it was great, then tell me it was great. I'm twitter.com slash Awaki. Frederick, thank you so much for having me on the Epicenter podcast. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank, thank you for coming on, Kevin. I, I'm looking forward to uh, round 20. <laughs>